to members of the City of Ottawa Traffic Management Operations Group, as well as to the Traffic Incident Management Group last week. And the feedback we received was very favorable. So then the question was, and put forward to us at Traffic Incident Management Group, why we couldn't do the same thing in the eastbound direction, as opposed to these lengthy detours that would require or would be required for the traffic detouring. So we've looked at using this. It was part of a conceptual detour as part of the staging. At the time we looked at this, the southeast ramp was closed, was going to remain closed for the duration of the Nicholas Street construction. At this point in time, it will be open. So we now suggest that the traffic comes off the west-south ramp onto Lees Avenue and then get back on to the 417 eastbound via the southeast ramp. So this concludes the actual Nicholas part of the project. We have one slide as part of the Nicholas project. There is another project, as you can see, the Highway 417 resurfacing and repurposing of the transit lanes from Nicholas to the Ottawa Road 174 split. It is going to be bundled in together with the Nicholas Street project. So currently the portions of the fourth lane widenings are exclusively being used by transit as reserved by the bus lanes. And they're also being used for queue jump lanes and direct entry. And it will include a nightly lane and ramp closures along the 417 in order to do the resurfacing and the line painting. We will have to close the Riverside Vanier north and south terminals as well as the St. Laurent south ramp terminal during off-peak in order to take care of the transit priority lanes and signals. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any other questions, both Mr. Lyndon Smith and myself are available at these coordinates. So please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I think there actually may be a few questions right here today. So Councillor Flory first, followed by Councillor Chernyshenko. Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Maybe just as a starting point, can you reassure us that the work would not proceed until the opening of light rail? I know that for us that corridor is certainly one that is very important, not only for access into the city's core, but also for transit operations. So we're expecting sometime in 2018 to open light rail, but we'd love to hear from you on if there were further delays, what that would mean for your project. That's correct. We are very mindful of the need for buses to be running on the Queensway as they are now. So we will structure our work so there's no conflict with that, and the work we would undertake in autumn would be work that could proceed while the buses are still using those lanes. Excellent. These are questions that I submitted because there was a consultation hosted, I guess, a few weeks ago, and I submitted those comments, and I never got a follow-up. But I'm intrigued by a couple of points. There are four points. One to me, which is ongoing safety concerns from people using – there's a weird sidewalk, which is a non-sidewalk, at Nicholas and Laurier, that on the, I guess, the west side of the corridor going towards the 417, that people fall into what I'll call as a no-man's land. Like, you don't realize you're walking down Laurier, you turn right, yeah, it looks like an on-ramp, but there's a sidewalk that's available. So I'd ask for a physical measure to be implemented near Laurier just so that we can protect the access to vehicular access only. Yeah, I believe that intersection would fall strictly within the city's jurisdiction, but if there's any impacts with our project to that, we would certainly work with the city 
with any initiative to address that issue. So I believe it would be mostly a city issue, but if there's any MTO involvement, we'll assist the city if we can. So can we take it as a takeaway from – Sure. They formed my comments at the time. I had four comments, and they might – some might fall onto the city. I'm just not aware as to – Certainly. We'll discuss it with the city and develop an approach between ourselves. And my final one that's relevant for this committee is the angle of the turn. Obviously, you're limited by space there, but I think there's a series of elements starting on the 417. Like if you're going eastbound and the folks that are entering on Isabella and the folks that are trying to get either off at Lee's or off at the Nicholas off-ramp, there's some confusion elements there, and I think a lot has to do with line painting and actual signage as we want folks to merge left sooner rather than keep progressing in that off lane. And then the other component that ties into that is the actual radius. Over the years, we've had trucks flip there, and I wonder how that is planned to be addressed as part of this. The minimum radius that we'll provide is actually the same as existing, but because the structure has shifted westerly, there will be a greater area with that radius. And you're absolutely correct. We're challenged in space with respect to the presence of Lee's Avenue, and any expansion of that loop would also have impact to the community to the west of the off-ramp and would push the off-ramp further back toward Metcalf as well. So you're absolutely right that we're challenged with space there. The geometry does meet our standards for radius, and we'll continue to post the conspicuous warning signs for trucks and what have you that we have in place today. Okay. And just to that, because both the off-ramp and the on-ramp sort of connect with each other as they go through the movement, there's a portion that's really near each other, and we've seen when a vehicular crosses that portion that it creates challenges. So I know that, for example, I think at St. Laurent, you've put a Jersey barrier in between. So is it part of the program here to correct that issue? So if there is any accident in one of the directions, that it doesn't impact both flows? Yeah, I can speak to that. We have actually, as part of the design, we do have a concrete barrier along the two or between the two ramps coming off of the structure right around to where it's no longer necessary. So it will. Okay. Thank you. Counselor Chernyshenko. Thank you very much. It is the first time I've seen this presentation, and especially the detour proposals. And although there is time, I think, to work out some of the specifics, and maybe we can make something work there, I do want to flag a number of serious concerns to what I see already. You had a slide that showed from a wider perspective the recommended detours, which included Main Street in that. Can we get that slide back up there, please? Yeah, if we could start with that one. So I guess my concern from the westbound direction, do I understand correctly this is the final, or at least this is your best recommendation, or do I understand that in the westbound direction you're no longer considering a route that involves Main Street, the Pretoria Bridge, Isabella, instead using that ramp surfing one? So your preferred proposal now is the ramp surfing option. That's correct. Okay, good, because I think we would all agree that rebuilding Main Street to become a resident, more of a residential street, and then turning it into part of the Queensway for a while just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And I don't think it would work either in terms of volume. We've already seen with the extended closure of the Lees on-ramp eastbound and all of the traffic having to take the Pretoria Bridge, go around the Loblaws and then up and on, we've seen significant congestion on Pretoria Bridge and that whole area over a number of years that never used to exist and probably won't again once we get the Lees ramp open. So if we could go to the next slide then where you are showing using Lees in the eastbound direction. There we go. 
it geographically this is totally logical it's the least uh, distance to be traveled uh, it can work of course my key concern is that Lee's Avenue does operate is effectively a residential street to many people um, it has got wide sidewalks it's got bicycle lanes um, it's got local transit routes uh, and so although this could work um, I think we'd have to do a lot of work into how exact the signaling people who have exited the Queensway are about to turn left onto Lee's. That's phenomenal volume for a very occasional um, uh, you know, ability to make that turn. Uh, same thing again, crossing back over um, to get onto the uh, what's labeled as the southeast ramp. We call the Lee's uh, on-ramp. Um, and uh, what, what length of period of time are you, can you remind me, are you suggesting here for this? We're looking at overnight weekend closure. We're so uh, okay. basically a, a Saturday to a Sunday night. And, and just once? And, and well, just there's two occasions where that okay. will happen, right? Two occasions. Uh, but so yes, once over the weekend. Okay. So essentially two weekends, if you, if you will, and, and, and overnights. All right. So at least the volumes will be, will, will be less, of course, nighttime. Um, challenge around, um, I guess, rather than in front of this committee, I, I hope we, including city staff, will, will work out uh, as safe as possible a uh, um, possibly full-time um, police surveillance at those two uh, left turns because of all of the crossover and, and quite different kinds of uh, traffic, people who are coming from and expecting to do a fairly high-speed traverse of the city and others who are very much in a residential mode, uh, you know, walking kids to school, etc. Um, I think that's it for now. I guess I did not see anywhere in this the need to stage off of green spaces, parks, etc. That's always a concern when we're taking parkland and using it to, to build. Uh, this isn't a rapid, uh, a rapid lift bridge build, so we don't need that space. Um, there may be construction workers and there's a significant amount of uh, vehicles associated with those people getting to the site and needing to park while they're there. Hopefully they're taking transit, but um, those who, who, who aren't able to, um, have you anticipated yet how you'll handle that? Well, with any kind of bridge construction, there, there, there are, you know, staging areas. Uh, they are uh, and will be located within the uh, MTO right away. Mm -hmm. And we will make provisions um, so that um, uh, the workers can access those um, from various points, of course, without impeding um, uh, traffic. Mm. Um, and and that's, there is a fair bit of MTO right of way there, so I, I guess what I would just say um, as an advance, I don't know if warning is the right word, request slash warning, um, that the green spaces that are parkland and, and, and used for recreational purposes um, you know, be considered off limits on the use of otherwise nice to look at grassland, but otherwise unused green space be the, the, the first and, and, and best choice for, for any kind of staging. There is also a landscape uh, a component to this project, so uh, there will be, as part of the concept, uh, context sensitive uh, design, uh, there will be some landscape um, provided at the, as, as the final product. As final product, yes. which does mean in the end, in a sense, we can trash it because it's going to be parking vehicles doing not, other things. No, trash is too strong a word, no, but, but using land, tire tracks, creating mud, knowing that it's going to be landscaped and, and, and refurbished afterwards is not such a blow to anyone. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Boy. Thanks. Uh, at the end of your presentation, you said the magic word that I thought was going to lead you to answer the question I have uh, relating to the 417 enclosures and updates, et cetera, is what is going on with the 417 ramp to the 174? Uh, it's closed because of the LRT detours. LRT is now six months behind schedule. Is that ramp going to open up when we open up LRT, or uh, are the rumors that you're going to keep it closed for longer true? And if so, when is the government of Ontario going to open it up? Uh, we met with city staff uh, a week or ten days ago to explore options at that ramp. And um, assuming the, the schedule for the LRT holds through, uh, we believe we can do enough advance work without impacting uh, traffic that would be able to reopen that ramp in 2018 uh, after the uh, light rail becomes operational and OC Transpo 
has no further need of that transit priority measure. So barring a significant run of horrible weather, we think we can do that with the current timelines. Perfect. So the 417 ramp will be open once LRT is open and the detours are done, barring extreme weather circumstances. Sorry, we have a resurfacing that we're going to do, the bulk of which will actually happen next year, although the contract would be awarded this year. But we will be able to, we will be able to open up that ramp this autumn, provided our schedule holds. And there might be some additional work next spring in the way of tidy up, but nothing, nothing like a closure like we've had for the past three years. Sure. So the resurfacing you're talking about, you said next year, we're still in the early part of 2018. Do you mean that resurfacing work is in 18 or that resurfacing work is in 19? We would, we would resurface the ramp in the autumn of 18 because the ramp's currently closed and that's the best time to do that. Yeah. We may have a little bit of paving work in the vicinity of the ramp that may have to happen in 19, which would mean possibly an isolated off-peak closure of that ramp for a very short period of time. Okay. But we are working with the city to try and open it this year. Perfect. And just so we're clear on what extreme weather means, does it mean the tiniest bit of snow in October and November? Like what is your definition of extreme weather that would stop the ramp from being open? The, some of the work that has to happen is temperature dependent, predominantly placing of paint. We think we can do most of that during the better weather months at that specific location. So all we're trying, all we're trying to say is, is we just contingent on, on not having a run of horrible weather and, and to try and predict them in the future, whether it's a week or two weeks or what would push us over the brink. It's, it's very difficult to say. I'm not asking you to predict what the weather is going to be. I'm trying to understand what is bad weather. Is it snow? How cold is cold? Like what are the circumstances specifically? Sorry, I misunderstood your question. Certainly, certainly snow and low temperatures would impede some of that work. Not the removal of pavement marking so much, but placing any new ones that had to go down. So we'll be working very closely with OC Transpo as the LRT date approaches to coordinate activities so we can be in there doing that work right after their requirement ends. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any other questions for this presentation? Okay. Received on the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our next, our next item is number two on the agenda, which again is the Ministry of Transportation. And this is the Highway 417 CPR O-Train bridge replacement. So I'd ask the MTO team to come forward. While they're doing that, I'm going to ask Councillor McKinney, the Vice Chair, to introduce her, her motion on this particular issue so you have it in front of you as you're hearing the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Just to briefly summarize and then I'll, I'll read it out into the record. This is to accommodate the businesses on Preston who will be losing some of their on-street parking as we detour for, for this closure. So where's the construction of the Ministry of Transportation Highway 417 CPR O-Train bridge replacement is scheduled to start in the spring of 2018 and is expected to last for the period of approximately one year. And where as a result, a partial closure of the Trillium multi-use pathway required, is required between Gladstone Avenue and Yonge Street to allow for the staging and construction of the overpass. And whereas a detour for cyclists and pedestrians is required, which will result in a loss of on-street parking spaces on Preston Street, Louisa Street, and Yonge Street. And whereas the loss of on-street parking in the area can be offset by promoting the use of city-owned parking lot on Preston Street, which will be helpful to local businesses that belong to the Preston Street Business Improvement area, as well as residents and visitors to the area. Therefore, 
be it resolved that Transportation Committee recommends that Council delegate to the General Manager of Public Works and Environmental Services the authority to modify the parking fees during the period of the CPR O-Train Bridge replacement construction in the city-owned lot located at 301 Preston Street to match the Preston Street on-street parking fee structure on weekdays from 5.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. The General Manager of Public Works and Environmental Services uh, reserves the right to reassess this change after a few months so that rates at the lot can be reinstated if required. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you for the, uh, for the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and the committee uh, for having us in today. My name is Peter Fru. I'm the Senior Project Engineer with the Ministry of Transportation Ontario. Uh, we're here to present to you uh, the Highway 417 CPR uh, O-Train rapid bridge replacements over the O-Train tracks. Uh, this is a very ambitious uh, technically and time-wise project. Uh, and uh, with me today I have WSP, who is the Ministry's consultant on this, and I'll turn it over to them for the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Lincoln McDonald. I'm the project manager for WSP. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of background on this project, uh, make everybody aware of what's going on. So MTO uh, completed a preliminary design and EA study for the rehabilitation and replacement of the Highway 417, what we call Midtown Bridges, to define a bridge management plan for 23 bridges and 12 sites in the Queensway between Holland Avenue and O'Connor Street. And that was completed approximately two years ago. Uh, the study determined that the CPR O-Train bridges are nearing the end of their service life and are in need of replacement. The current detailed design project involves the replacement of the 417 bridges over the CPR O-Train corridor using rapid replacement technology, detouring of the Trillium multi-use pathway between Gladstone and Young Street during construction, and construction of related works including retaining walls, pavement rehab, drainage improvements, uh, modifications to the existing illumination and ATMS systems, some utility relocations and landscaping as required. So for those not familiar with it, the O-Train uh, CPR is located uh, west of Preston Street Interchange. Um, the existing structure is five span, uh, constructed in the early 60s. Um, the new decks are to be replaced using a rapid replacement technology. Uh, the revised span width uh, will accommodate the existing O-Train corridor. It protects for the future track widening and twinning that is, uh, I believe, being proposed under the Trillium line uh, uh, design and accommodates the existing multi-use pathway on the west side as well as protects for a future pathway on the west side. And the existing structure is approximately 85 meters in length over five spans. Uh, so the required work includes the construction of t new abutments, uh, backfilling the existing approaches. Uh, they'll be uh, constructed and backfilled to approximately two meters below the existing. That will happen while traffic is being maintained on the 417. The new bridge decks are being constructed to the north of the existing 417. Um, on, on stands, if you want to call them that. And uh, as part of the new technology, this rapid replacement methodology is, is different than what's been used previously on the Queensway. On the Queensway previously, they were used uh, with transporters with the bridges being built and then moved into place. Uh, in this case, they're being built on stands and the methodology of replacement is called a jack and slide technology. So they'll, uh, they'll be pushed into place into the new, uh, new arrangement. Uh, during the single full closure of the 417, uh, the existing bridges will be uh, demolished in place and the debris will be removed and that will allow the new bridges to be slid into place. Uh, after the bridges are slid into place, the uh, backfill operations will be completed, uh, the road structure will be constructed and the highway will be paved. After the uh, rapid replacement weekend, uh, construction will continue on 417 uh, 
to address uh, new approach slabs for the structures, uh, median storm sewer that has to be built, some new median concrete barrier, as well as uh, snow guards. Under the new bridges, the old piers were removed, uh, the temporary stands will get removed, and protection measures that are being put in place for the old train will be removed, and the reinstatement of the multi-use pathway and final restoration and landscaping will take place. So the construction site area is very contained and, and uh, small. It's, it's an extremely difficult site to work in. So um, as part of the negotiations with the NCC and with the City of Ottawa, uh, we have developed a site area where the contractor can do his laydowns and, and operate and access the site. He'll be accessing off of Gladstone Avenue. Uh, primarily his, his main corridor site will be the west side of the Loretta of the O train, uh, adjacent to the Loretta Traffic Operations Facility. Uh, the ministry has entered into a property agreement with the Loretta facility to, to occupy their back parking lot as part of the staging area for this replacement. Uh, on the east side of the O train corridor, uh, it's primarily NCC land and uh, an agreement is, being, is, is in the process of being obtained with them to occupy their land to be able to do uh, the staging area. This is also the, the area, the side that the Trillium multi-use pathway is located. On the south side of the highway, there's a small corridor off the cul-de-sac at Young Street that re is required to access that side of the structure. And on the west side is uh, currently where 47 Young Street is occupied. And the ministry is in the process of purchasing that property and that will be used as a staging area as well. Uh, the multi-use pathway will be detoured uh, along the south side of Young Street, north along the west side of Preston Avenue, westerly along Louisa Street, and then it will come up through what is, called, uh, what is called, I guess, the Loretta Yards Traffic Lower Yard. Uh, they have a traffic facility yard that they use for storage material. Um, it will be a bi-directional bike lanes on Young Street and the west side of Preston, and they're segregated from traffic. The bike lanes will share the lane on Louisa Street. Uh, the pathway, as I noted, is being realigned between Louisa and Gladstone. On-street parking will be moved from Young Street, Louisa, and along Preston Street between Young Street and Louisa Street. Uh, the City of Ottawa is currently providing the design uh, for this uh, detour map. O-Train protection. We're aware of the significance that O-Train has to the city and its uh, transit operations. Uh, we've been in discussions with uh, O-Train and are continuing to have discussions with O-Train. Uh, unfortunately, certain construction operations cannot be performed while the O-Train is in service. Uh, construction operations would need to stop every time a train approaches. Currently, the trains are running between 7 and 12 minutes. It, uh, it, it really impacts production and makes it very difficult to carry out some of this work. Uh, O-Train closures currently are nightly from 12.30 to 5.00. However, due to the complexity of the construction, uh, this construction window, which is less than four hours for productive operations, is too short. So in order to allow the bridge construction operations to proceed without continuous interruptions, a temporary CSP, corrugated steel pipe arch culvert, is being installed over the tracks within the, uh, the bridge corridor and north of the bridge corridor underneath the, where the temporary stands and the, and the new bridges are being built. Uh, a three-week closure has been uh, negotiated with O-Train as required at the start of the construction in year one in order to install the protection measures over the O-Train. A second three-week closure of the O-Train is required in the second year, and that's for the rapid replacement of the actual Highway 417 bridges as well as the removal of the protection measures. O-Train closure periods currently are targeted from mid-July to mid-August to minimize impacts to train users and ensure that the train is in operation for, uh, for the school season at the University of Carleton. Highway 417 closures. Uh, there is a three-day, 82-hour closure required for the 417 to allow the rapid replacement operation to uh, be undertaken. 417 will be fully closed from Carling Avenue to Bronson Avenue, including the on-ramps within this section of the highway. As on past projects, the contractor is required to organize an incident management team, which will include members of the City of Ottawa's Traffic Incident Management Group, MTO Operations, 
and contract staff, MTL contract administrator, and the contractor's key staff. A communications plan will be in place to advise the City of Ottawa, OC Transport residents, and the emergency services all plan closures and detours. Um, so the detour route coming westbound, you'd get off at Bronson along Carling, uh, south on Bronson along Carling, uh, and then back on at the Carling westbound on-ramp. Eastbound traffic would get off at the Carling eastbound uh, off-ramp, would proceed along Carling Avenue, and get back on uh, via Champ Chamberlain and onto the uh, Isabella on-ramp. Uh, the Parkdale ramps, westbound on-ramp will remain open to all traffic. The eastbound on-ramp will be open only to emergency vehicles, so that the hospital still has access that they have to, have to proceed. So a summary of construction staging and traffic impacts. So at the car start of construction, uh, there will be the fourth lane in this direction, in either direction on westbound and eastbound in this area will be closed. Uh, three lanes of traffic will be maintained during the peak hours. The ramps will be maintained for the most part. Uh, the acceleration deceleration lanes for those ramps will be taken from the fourth lane. Uh, before the rapid actual rapid replacement, we will have nightly and weekend 417 lane reductions to allow for some pre-work that has to be done on the highway before the actual replacements. During the rapid replacement, there will be a full closure of the 417 from Carling to Bronson. The Carling e Avenue eastbound on-ramp will be closed. The Carling eastbound, uh, westbound ramp, eastbound on-ramp will be closed. Parkdale Avenue eastbound on-ramp will be closed except for emergency services. Rochester Avenue and Bronson Avenue westbound on-ramps. So it's a three-day Closure, 82 hours in, in duration. Highway 417, closure of the two lanes of 417 eastbound requires the closure of the falling ramps, and that's the Rochester Avenue west and north-south ramp and the Parkdale Avenue north-south to east ramp. Uh, possibly up to seven closures only on the weekend, so. Uh, Post-rapid replacement operations, uh, we will require uh, a requirement to close two lanes in the 417 to allow for the approach slabs and median barrier to be constructed. Uh, this will also impact the ramps at Rochester Avenue north-south ramp, uh, westbound on-ramp, the Bronson Avenue north-south west, westbound on-ramp, and the Lyon Avenue northwest ramp, westbound on-ramp. Uh, our contact information is there should you have any questions for myself or for MTO. Uh, I open the, 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 the mics to the board if, if the committee has any questions. Are there any questions? Okay. No, they're not. So thank you very much. Um, uh, and on uh, Councillor McKinney's uh, motion regarding parking, carried? Carried. Okay. And received on the presentation? Received. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, the um, right-of-way patio bylaw, review of pedestrian clearway and accessibility requirements for existing patios. Uh, we have a presentation on this, so I'm going to ask staff to come up. Uh, following the presentation, we have a number of public delegations, so I'll ask for councillors to hold their questions until after the public delegations if they have any questions for staff. and uh, I'll let you introduce the presentation and uh, off you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Rob McLachlan. I'm a bylaw review specialist with the right-of-way branch. On my left is Jake Ravel, program manager with Bylaw and Regulatory Services, Linda Karkner, program manager of the right-of-way branch, and Corp Curry, manager of Rohud. And as mentioned, we're here today to speak to the report dealing with the right-of-way patio and specifically the review of the pedestrian clearway and barrier-free access issues for existing patios. 
Firstly, a bit of background. As the committee is well aware, last year in March, the, uh, a new standalone bylaw for the regulation of patios was put into place um, with respect to those within the road allowance. And two key requirements regarding those were that a pedestrian clearway being that space requiring for unencumbered and clear pedestrian travel next to the patio uh, be provided at a minimum of two meters and also that barrier-free access of the patios in accordance with the city's accessibility design standards be provided. For those patios existing at the time the bylaw was passed, a one-year reprieve was provided up until April 1st of this year to comply with those. The um, caveat to that being that those patios along Elgin Street were provided um, by council with relief from these two requirements until such time as the pedestrian clearway was reinstated after the Elgin Street reconstruction. Staff were, at the time the bylaw was passed, required to report back to committee on the progress that had been made in designating the pedestrian clearway next to these existing patios, as well as the extent to which these patios comply with the city's accessibility design standards. Turning first to the uh, pedestrian clearway, and I think it's important for context that we begin with a brief overview of the regulations that apply to the pedestrian clearway. The first is the Provincial Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or the AODA, which requires that for newly constructed or redeveloped pedestrian clearways after January 1st of 2016, that a 1.5 meter width be provided. The next is the city's accessibility design standards, which provides that a 1.8 meter wide pedestrian clearway be provided, or where a lesser width is provided that at intervals of no greater than 30 meters, a 1.8 by 1.8 passing area be provided. And you'll see on the uh, slide there a graphic representing those two um, situations. As a best practice, the ADS also provides that where feasible, a two meter pedestrian clearway uh, should also be provided. The right of way patio bylaw codifies this best practice requirement in requiring at a minimum a two meter wide pedestrian clearway with the intent that the city of Ottawa be a leader in accessibility in this particular area. Based on a review of 87 patios, 52 of these were identified by staff as having a pedestrian clearway next to them that was less than two meters in width. These locations were provided to Parsons, who was hired to document the, the actual pedestrian clearway next to these patios, as well as to document the location of city infrastructure within this area. Parsons was also asked to identify possible solutions to, the two meter, to achieve a minimum two meter pedestrian clearway in these situations. Overall, the review identified that these pedestrian clearways next to existing patios complied with the AODA and the city's ADS. And in addition, in at least 40 of these existing patios, the pedestrian clearway was mirrored between the patio and city infrastructure such as bike racks, pay and display machines, and traffic and parking signs. Opportunities were also identified to investigate where patios could be moved away from the building face to curbside or street side locations in order to achieve a minimum two meter pedestrian clearway. And lastly, there were some instances where the location of infrastructure, such as hydro poles and rankers, or the width of existing sidewalks meant that there would be, uh, despite any modifications to the patio footprint, no real gains to the width of the pedestrian travel achieved. And I'll speak more to this uh, when we get to the recommendations of the report. Parsons also reviewed the extent to which the 87 patios provided for barrier-free or universal access. 37 of the patios were found not to be universally accessible, 32 of which were uh, uh, ones which employed a platform. Solutions include bringing the patio closer to or to grade, or where necessary, utilizing a ramp. Going forward, ramps will need to be designed in accordance with the accessibility design standards of the city. Since Parsons completed this work, staff have been meeting with existing patio owners to discuss the findings relevant to their patio and discussing the options available for coming into conformity with the bylaw. Again, based on the findings of Parsons, staff have several recommendations for committee and council consideration. The first of these is that the bylaw be amended to provide the general manager with the delegated authority to permit a lesser clear way within two meters next to existing patios in those situations where the abutting sidewalk is itself less than two meters in width or where there is immovable infrastructure such as hydro poles and anchors standing between the patio and the sidewalk. In these instances, of which staff are aware of 13, 
No real gains to the area of travel for pedestrians can be achieved by making the existing patio move back. Recognizing that existing patio owners will face a cost to modify their patios to meet the requirements of the bylaw, the staff are also recommending a one-time fee reduction for existing patio owners this uh, summer patio season. The reduction is proposed to equal 25% of the permit fee up to a maximum of $2,000. To qualify, an existing patio owner will need to modify their patio to come into conformity with the bylaw. Staff are also seeking $50,000 to cover the cost of removing infrastructure within the pedestrian clearway next to existing patios. And both of these recommendations are proposed to be funded by the provision for unforeseen and one-time expenditures. Lastly, staff are recommending that the waiver for the pedestrian clearway requirement for the patio associated with Pabatalia continue. This waiver was granted by council in 2012 and the patio has not changed since this time. In terms of next steps, staff will continue to work with patio owners to identify options for coming into conformity with the bylaw and meeting the requirements for the pedestrian clearway as well as the ADS. The staff will work to remove infrastructure or replace inf or sorry, relocate infrastructure where possible and will continue ongoing patio inspections and enforcement of patio permit conditions as well as the bylaw as required. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank all the staff that worked on this report. I know it's been a long time coming and there's um, been a real focus on making making our, our sidewalks um, a lot more usable by everybody, every mode of transportation. Um, and uh, in that regard, I also want to thank uh, Councillor Caudry in his role with the Accessibility Advisory Committee and acting as a, as a very able sounding board on some of these discussions. And uh, so I want to thank you for your role in this as well. Um, we have a number of uh, uh, delegations uh, to speak to this. So um, again, if you could hold your questions for staff. And the first, um, I'm going to try this, uh, is Dennis Van Stel Dunyan, close? Close. Close. Um, from the uh, Wellington West uh, Business Improvement Area. Good morning. Good morning. I think, you've, I think you've been here before, so you know the rules. You have five minutes. Uh, Dan Van is much easier, but uh, Van Stel Dynan, for the record. Um, good try, though. Most people don't even attempt it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Vice Chair, Councillors, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today about this important matter. Um, I speak on behalf of the Wellington West Business Improvement Area as the newly minted Executive Director of this association, and this is my first chance to present to this committee. But as your uh, area of expertise is of great concern to uh, my members in terms of parking, in terms of patios, in terms of bicycles and multimodal transportation, I don't imagine it will be the last. Um, I'd also like to thank the staff and consultants who've done such a diligent job on this particular file uh, over the past few years, and I really appreciate uh, their meeting with us to go in detail and their responsiveness in getting us information upon request. It is our job as a BIA to improve the Wellington West corridor and thus bring life, energy, and animation to the public spaces along it. And the proliferation of restaurant patios along our corridor from only a small handful that are founding to two, in 2008 to more than a dozen today has actually always been one of our metrics of success as a business improvement area. We measure our success by how many patios we have and how much life they bring to our neighborhood. So it's a little disorienting for me as someone new to your subject matter uh, to read the report and to hear the language that's being used that speak of patios in exactly the opposite way. Uh, where bylaw language treats patios as obstructions to the clearway, uh, we see opportunities for people of all abilities and ages to sit and enjoy the summer sun. Where staff views streets and sidewalks as rights of way, we see public spaces for people to slow down, linger, and explore our neighborhoods. Where your committee manages patios as encroachments in the same category that you manage construction blockages and hoarding, we see patios as a real estate manager might as capital enhancements to our area. So while we understand and we absolutely approve of the 
uh, thrust of this effort, uh, we look at it a little bit more, a little, little bit differently. And we understand that a bylaw is a blunt instrument, and there are good reasons. Uh, but we, uh, we appreciate and share the goal to make sure our streets and patios are as accessible as possible to everyone. What's missing among all the charts and measurements in the report and the presentation you've seen is any fulsome discussion of the benefits of patios to all users of the neighborhood, the time, cost, and stress level encroachment that these changes impose on the business owners, and I might add the painfully short uh, notice uh, given to them of their, uh, of their exact infractions and of the options available to them, or the risk that a patio might in disappear entirely, and that's what I'm hearing, due to the requirements uh, becoming too onerous and, uh, and, of course, the possibility that the business itself might close down if they cannot make the money that they have anticipated for this season. So we'd like to ask you for consideration on a few points. First of all, we support wholeheartedly efforts to improve accessibility of the patios themselves. Access to those patios is something we are not going to comment on. We will work with your staff and members to bring existing patios into compliance and ensure new patios also conform. We strongly agree with that point. We support the principle of wider clearways as the standard for all future patios. We think these regulations are forward-looking and reasonable and set a standard for the, for the city that is ahead of the game in terms of the province. We also support the proposed fee reductions and funds to move city infrastructure where reasonable and necessary uh, as, uh, as, a, as, as, as considerations for people who put in the time and effort to make the changes. Uh, we also uh, ask for a permissive approach to non-obstructing patios along existing sidewalks. So we support the recommendation where in cases like the Carlton Tavern, where the side patio does not intrude on the existing sidewalk at all or any municipal infrastructure, we support delegation of authority to the general manager of planning infrastructure and economic development to deal with those issues on a common sense basis. And I think that will be one where there will be a, an absolute slam dunk uh, for, for the existing patio. But for patios where uh, significant changes to the, the structure of the patio are required, we ask strongly for more time and leniency in the application of the guidelines, particularly regarding the two seasonal patios at Bar Laurel and at Tennessee Willems. Both of those patios uh, are less than five years old, and the, the, the bar managers and, and restaurant owners built those in good faith under the existing rules, uh, and they were a little surprised to find that they were in contravention at the, and that it was going to be coming up this coming year. Um, in cases like them, uh, they may be in violation of the change rules, but we ask for reasonable consideration. And we also ask to consider the broader benefits these patios bring, the low level of complaints or actual problems that they've generated thus far, or at least if there are those complaints or problems, make sure that they're added to the record so that we can consider them as well. And also the fact that they're completely removed and therefore offer no obstruction for six months of the year. You have a fully wide and accessible uh, 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 sidewalk for most of the year. It's only during the summer months, which is when they also add their benefits. So in the longer term, though, um, and this is where I'm a little bit at sea as someone new to this process, but it seems to me that I'd like to ask for a process where you could consider... I'm going to have to ask you to, to wrap up. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, reasonable adjustments, something like a committee of adjustment or, or, or an application process where small infractions like the three centimeters for the bar laurel uh, 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 in, in infringement could be considered and applied for by the community, uh, considered by the community. I thank you for, you for your time today, and uh, we as a BIA stand eager to help you with the implementation of the suggestions above. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions for the delegation? Yes, Councilman Manette. Yeah, you mentioned uh, more time and leniency. What, like, what type of uh, time frame are you looking at? Well, certainly, um, I was just on the phone with uh, the owner of Bar Laurel, and um, he's only had really two weeks to look at the recommendations and to react. Now, if you think of the time frame involved with actually planning and applying for a patio in the first place and all of the consultations and delays that are required, I would say that at least a year between finding out what the, the mitigations required are and... Uh, being expected to respond to them would be reasonable. Uh, they're being asked to actually uh, respond by the application for this patio season this spring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions uh, for the delegation? Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
Our next delegation is, uh, is a trio uh, coming up to share their five minutes. Oh, I see. So, you, so, you're, so you're not coming up together then. Alrighty. Um, so uh, first we have uh, Ms. Jennings, who's just clarified that for us. Thank you. Uh, followed by uh, Steve uh, or Todd Brown, rather, and then followed by uh, Steve Manuk. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you again. My name is Yasna Jennings, Executive Director of the Byward Market BIA, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Um, I think we could probably uh, echo some of the comments of my colleague. Patios are a very important element to both the overall business model of our restaurateurs and the general appeal of the area to visitors. Patios contribute to the safety of an area by providing eyes on the street, are a tourism draw, and contribute to the overall enjoyment of our city. It was roughly a year ago that we were here last speaking about patios. The BIA has always supported the spirit and intent of the new bylaw and support the efforts to be more globally accessible, but we challenged the manner of application and implementation. It was our understanding that staff would work with the businesses and come back with recommendations to assist them with compliance. However, the report was only released this past Friday. This is simply not enough time for businesses to react and make the required changes. Therefore, we are also requesting a deferral for the implementation of the new rules. In order to be compliant, businesses need to completely redesign and reconstruct their patios. Engineering drawings are required. Materials need to be chosen, purchased, delivered. Final designs need city approval, and contractors need to be secured for construction. Patio season starts April 1st. Clearly, there is no time for businesses to achieve all of this in this tiny little time frame. May and June are the busiest times in the market. We have repeatedly and consistently objected to any construction or disruptions taking place in the spring. Spring is not the time to start construction to try to make patios compliant. It is simply not feasible that staff, contractors, and all permits, etc., will be done by April 1st. The highest volume of tour buses come through the area in May and June, and spring sets the tone for the whole season for locals. Construction should be scheduled, uh, sorry, to lose this vital business window would be devastating to businesses. Construction should be scheduled in the fall where negative impacts are greatly minimized. This infrastructure and process costs tens of thousands of dollars and includes design, construction, installation, dismantled storage. Every inch was carefully planned to accommodate the original regulations, the existing sidewalk conditions, city infrastructure, etc. In order to meet the new requirements, uh, all platforms will need to be renovated or in most cases completely reconstructed. Three weeks is simply not enough time for businesses and businesses want to get it right. Unlike most other neighborhoods in the urban core, most of whom have all had major investments, improvements and even expansions to their right of way, the Byron market is plagued with aging infrastructure and limited sidewalk space. In order to provide a safe and secure surface for both their customers and staff, most businesses have had to design and construct patio platforms to address issues of sidewalk sloping, uneven, and or patchy work on sidewalks. Therefore, simply relocating patios directly on the sidewalk is really not possible in most cases. Finally, we recently learned of the next phases of the Byward Market Revitalization Plan. It includes a full review of the district's right-of-way and public spaces. This presents the perfect opportunity for a full patio review in the market. A holistic approach is the best way to go. Opportunities were also identified way back in 08 and 09 through our local parking study, and patios and public space places were also a recommendation in the PPS report, which drove the Byward Market revitalization process. It makes no sense, nor is it acceptable or respectable respectful to burden businesses with major costs to make changes this year, only to risk having to do it all over again in a year or two once the public realm review is done. 
In conclusion, we respectfully request that implementation of the new patio rules to existing patios in the byward market be deferred until the completion of the public realm work. We truly believe that a wide variety of opportunities and innovative approaches exist, but will only be realized through a more comprehensive and encompassing look at all the public realm elements in the market. This approach is in fact the most civically responsible and fiscally prudent approach to achieve the goal of an overall ex uh, improved experience for all. Thank you. Um, do I still have time? Well, I'm only asking because Lori Meller from the Preston BIA just contacted me. She's in dental surgery, and she had the same impression. Their businesses, too, were under the understanding that once the recommendations came out, they were going to start working with city staff uh, for those that had to be compliant. So they, too, have also asked for a deferral to allow the work to happen and time for all these changes. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll have questions for city staff um, after all the delegations, uh, though it's certainly been my understanding that city staff has been meeting with individual businesses for quite some time now and having discussions about what was coming down the pipe, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, though uh, Councillor Forty has indicated you would like to ask one question staff, which is directly related to something that you've raised, so I'm going to allow that. So I guess the question is uh, for court. Uh, the uh, Yasna was speaking about the holistic component, which obviously I think we're all on the same page that we want uh, the area to have a, you know, an improved look and feel, an improved public realm, and so on. And I know that uh, your team and Dana, more specifically, and um, Jillian are working on on those efforts. Maybe uh, maybe you could speak uh, to uh, how how this effort doesn't or does it how does it impact uh, that review and how will, how will those kind of tie in together at some point? So, Councillor, we'll be embarking upon this spring of public realm plan for the Byward Market Precinct writ large. Uh, that plan development, will, which will have extensive stakeholder consultation, will take approximately about a year. And the outcomes of that may be um, potential redesigns for some of the corridors where we do have patios currently. Um, but that will lead to a capital project that at this time has no funding and will be subject to future uh, capital budget asks. That's a multi-year rollout uh, at best. Uh, I think we'd be in a position to put forward some money for design in 2020. Um, so we've taken a practical approach with the conversations we've had with patio owners thus far to look at options um, that are minimal um, in terms of changes that need to be made between now and then by recognizing that an overall implementation of a larger plan is many years away. Very much. Any other questions for delegation? Uh, yeah, Councillor Kakish. Thanks, Chair. And I just wanted to clarify because uh, the Chair had mentioned that staff have been working with businesses on that April uh, d um, deadline. Um, and you were saying that uh, the BIA representatives are saying that you kind of didn't know. So I just want to clarify, have you been talking to staff over the past few months and were you aware of the timelines and asked for them to be pushed or did you just find out when this report went live last week? So we were, we were uh, as the BIA, we were uh, contacted near three weeks ago. It was just a couple of days. Uh, we were back in the middle of winter mood and that was our first uh, contact from staff. But uh, I do know some businesses had spoken with staff, but again, they were under the impression that, uh, you know, this report was going to come out, recommendations, and then we were going to kind of look at the, um, at what that, uh, what that meant and how they could start, you know, looking at altering their patios. But most people were really, again, we're April 1st, uh, most of their patios actually are going up even in time for St. Patty's Day. So many of them were kind of taken aback that they would have to do it immediately. They thought this was kind of going to be the process, that we were working through the process. Okay, and so since you were notified around that time a month or so ago, have you been raising concerns about that timeline with staff, uh, working with them on that? Yeah, I, uh, yes. Actually, uh, my vice chair is here, so he, he met with staff, I think, about two weeks ago, um, so he can comment on, um, on that. Okay. 
I'd like to know what staff have, have told you uh, in those conversations. Well, we actually were, um, we just had a conversation shortly before the meeting and there's, there's definitely a misunderstanding. And one of the business owners, you know, had said, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty on the ball with all of these things. And I even was really under the impression that once the recommendations came out, then we were going to start, you know, working together to see what we could do. And for most people, I think they would be looking at making changes in the fall. If we're going to have to move poles, if we're going to have to move things, if we're going to, if there's going to be small, um, construction improvements or changes that those types of things would come about in the fall after we've kind of worked through um, the bigger process. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Councillor Kakish. Um, just again, for clarification of staff, we're, we're hearing um, from Ms. Jennings that you, you first met in February about this project um, with, with her BIA. Is, is that accurate? Just that was the first time you met this past February? Uh, Chair, um, in response to that, no, we started meetings in November with the individual patio owners to identify where they had clearway issues or accessibility issues on their patios. So those meetings started uh, last November. And, and, and but more particularly, um, meetings with Ms. 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 Jennings and or on behalf of the BIA was the first one this past February. Yes, the meetings with the, the BIA itself was in February. But the individual businesses that were impacted that Ms. Jennings has referenced, you started meeting with them in November of last year? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I, I just want to clarify because I, I do think there might be an issue of uh, that you described as in terms of touch points and, and progress, and that's, you know, that's a, a fair statement. But we did meet, and I believe you or your, someone from your team was there last year when I think Linda and Court and I met with businesses along Clarence and along York ahead of 2017 to speak to some of the changes that were, had been approved but that we weren't going to, we were going to give a year's leeway. So I'm confused now as to, at that time, this committee had given direction to staff at, at it not like that's maybe maybe we can take a second and, and hear from staff on to how far back that goes because when I met with businesses last year uh, we had given kind of a year's touch point and I'm not sure uh, I'm not sure as to uh, how we find ourselves now at what feels like a you know new new information when uh, maybe not everyone but at least some of the members uh, were aware at the time and there had been some direction from committee uh, to, to do some work. So Chair, uh, it was a year ago, actually a year and a day that we were in this room and uh, recommendation three of our report as a result of our stakeholder feedback was to defer implementation of components of the bylaw related to accessibility for one year. And that was specifically because we heard from our business owners that 2017 was an important year, this was a lot of change and we needed time to get this right. So uh, council concurred with that and uh, we, as Rob uh, noted, hired a consultant to design per patio uh, what we've called placemats, which was various options that they could, they could undertake to comply with the bylaw. Uh, throughout 2017, we sent two pieces of correspondence to all permit holders, letting them know that council had approved a new bylaw with a one-year reprieve. We then, as uh, Ms. Carker indicated, started meeting with individual patio owners in the fall to go over uh, the potential options for their specific patios, um, as well as with the BIAs. Uh, so certainly, I think our, we have uh, done a, a good job in terms of engaging with the BIAs and, and patio owners uh, beyond the one-year uh, reprieve. What was at issue in the last few weeks was uh, some of the recommendations in the report related to city costs. Would we be able to uh, put forward um, funds to remove city infrastructure to assist in creating a wider clearway? And would we be able to offer um, a reduction in permit fees beyond the 22% uh, uh, fee reduction that council gave last year for patio permit holders in order to uh, help uh, property owners and patio owner permit holders with the transition costs and so that uh, wasn't of course uh, we weren't able to reveal that until the report was published last Wednesday. Okay, great. So uh, yes I'll follow up when the question comes to staff relating to the relief and uh, some of the strategies that can be looked at. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Brown, Todd Brown is next.
Good morning, welcome. You have five minutes. I'm a partner in about 25 different restaurants in this city, including Pure Kitchen, El Camino, Clock Tower Brew Pubs, numerous places in the Byward Market. I have had exactly two 30-minute meetings with city staff over this issue. And it was on the street informally. That is hardly enough time and effort put into discussing the issue with us. It's a very important issue and it needs to be deferred and we need to really look at it and decide how we're dealing with it. Most of my patios are on their way up. Patio season starts April 1st. We're three weeks away. We're just, we're understanding today, and I'm a pretty sophisticated business person, I'm understanding today that we have to do this. I did not understand that. I had no idea that was happening. That's all I'd like to say. Uh, thank you. Any questions? I, I have a question. Um, how many businesses of yours or that you have an interest in would be impacted by the changes? Um, well, again, I'm not quite clear on that. I haven't really seen. I've been shown a few of the places. I would think 10 to 15 of them, but I, I'm not clear. There's no implementation plan. There's no timing of how all of this is supposed to get done, and patios are supposed to go up. April 1st. Okay. Cause, cause my Some of our patios are already up. We left them up through the winter We uh, under the new bylaw. Correct. And you were, you were allowed to do that. Um, and well, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with staff. But my understanding is that all impacted businesses have been met with and discussions around potential changes necessary have been had. So I'll, when it's time to ask questions to staff. As I said, there were two informal meetings that happened on sidewalks. I, I've not seen the written stuff. I've not seen how we're going to implement this. I've not seen any of that. All right. And you say you think you have 15 businesses. I, I could have 15 businesses that are impacted by it, yes. It, is it possible, sir, that because you have multiple interests and multiple interests that staff may have spoken to one of your business partners or managers of the locations? Uh, I don't think so. But you don't know? No, I don't think so. I'm the person that would be dealing with construction on all the patios. Okay. All right, Vice Jeff. Thank you. Just a quick question to staff. How many uh, patios are and will be impacted by this change across the city? Mr. Chair, there should be approximately uh, 61 patios that, that would need to make. There would there'd be about 61 patios that would need, based on 2017 records, that would need to make a change either with respect to the accessibility design standard portion or the clearway portion of the patio bylaw. And how many for the clearway? I believe there are, uh, Mr. Chair, approximately um, 47. Thank you. Is that a pressure? Yeah. And uh, the, the 47 in and around the clearway, has staff had discussions with each of those 47 businesses? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I can't say definitively that discussions have happened all, but all have been contacted to try and arrange discussions, and most have been met with, yes. And most have, have responded. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Foy. Just to follow up, um, Todd, th thank you for uh, being here. And I, I know that you don't show up at committee often, so I, I certainly know that uh, you're here because it, uh, it impacts you directly and it's, uh, it's of concern to you. So appreciate ta you taking the time to be here. Um, is it possible, and I, I spoke to staff about this, that it, it may be a technicality, but to get a patio, is it possible that it's the general manager or a different staff that actually goes in and submits and it's under a different name? Because my understanding is that there's not a bulk of, 
of patios that are under one uh, contact person. There's multiple contact persons for most of uh, the patios. So is it, is it possible that you know, maybe you could work offline to establish those contacts for each of those encroachments? Because I, I fear that that's what's happening here, that uh, there's someone that goes and gets the permits that puts their name in. You know, as, you, as you've highlighted, your, your partner, obviously there's a lot of employees as well that are, that are, uh, that are involved in your business. Is it possible that that would have happened as part of this? All my encroachment permits are applied for by one person, Sue McLeod, in my office. She approves all of that with me. She goes through the layouts and what they're going to look like. Okay. At this point, we would just be putting our patios up, sending in the permit for the application even after the patio is up. And the, as far as we're concerned, the application always is dealing with the fees and not with the construction of the patio. These are all existing patios, and that would be how we would install our patios every year. We would put them up, she'd contact the city, find out how much money we got to pay, and send the checks. Okay. That's the application process. And, you know, I, I want to say here that we support the idea of, of what's going on here. We really do support this idea. We just don't think it's being dealt with properly, and there's not enough time put into it. And it should be done right. And then you, in the bio market in particular, where there's going to be a public realm study, why are we rushing all of this? I, I don't understand. Okay, thank you. In I just want to ask a question for you, sir. So in terms of the deferral, are you on the same page as Ms. Ms. Jennings that it should be put off to the fall of this year? Or are you saying something different? And, no, I'm in complete, in complete agreement with, uh, with that idea. Assuming we get results and assuming that we actually get things done, yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that means. So we, I want to get it deferred to the fall, but if we haven't reached a resolution by the fall, then it's, it should get deferred till everyone's in agreement of how we go forward and that there's an implement, implementation no, plan. That, that, that's not exactly how it works. Um, you can agree to disagree with something that we, we, uh, we vote on, but... You know, so obviously we're trying, trying to, to the fall, we're trying yes. to get to a consensus point, but that, that's not always the case. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, next, we have Mr. Manuk. Oh, sorry, sorry Councillor. Uh, yes, I, oh, I do. I do. Uh, Councillor Deans. <laughs> I, I just want to understand a little bit more about what, when you said you had two informal meetings. It, it just comes as a surprise to me that it would be on an informal basis that the city staff would be reaching out to the businesses impacted by this change. So what do you mean informal? You just happen to be there one day and they no, walk by? Or? No, they contact us for a meeting, but we go and we're standing on a street corner and we're looking at the street oh, and okay, how is that a formal meeting you know? okay well that's, i actually think that's a good meeting because an on-site location is perfect because you're looking at exactly what you're looking at i thought you meant when you said informal i'm conjuring up images that they just happened by one day well, again they were just discussions of something that we would like to do so to me a formal meeting is where there's a proposal you have something in writing, you look at it, and you, you make comments on that exact thing. Okay, but, but it has been coming for a year, so there has been... Uh, I did not have that understanding as well. Did the city staff send written notification to the impacted businesses in the last year, to all of them? Yes, we did. Following uh, Council's uh, approval of the bylaw last year, information was sent to all the patio owners on record at that time, letting them know the new patio bylaw and what the new requirements were. In addition, when we met on site, we did provide um, uh, the placemats that showed where there were issues and identified any ADS um, okay. non-compliance for each location. Okay, so every single impacted patio has had a written notification and an on-site meeting with an, an explanation of the changes required on their particular site. Yes, they have. Well, I have to disagree with that. Uh, so uh, it, again, it doesn't quite work that way. If, if Councillor Deans wants to ask you the question. Sorry. Would you agree with that? 
I, I have to disagree with that, that comment. Um, I certainly believe we were working in a direction of, of coming up with solutions, but uh, I, I still don't see what the solutions are. I, we're, we're unsure of everything. I mean, of what I'm everything. hearing from city staff is they gave you information that showed what the changes would be, and they met on site with you. They, they talked about the two meter clearance. They talked about how there were things in the way. We suggested that, that they get removed. We suggested them raising sidewalks. There were many suggestions. There was no talk of the implementation and the timeline and that we were working together. And all of a sudden, we see this thing. In, the, in fact, I just saw it three days ago. Okay, and when you this said you have, I think you said you're partners in 25 That's um, restaurants in Ottawa, um, and you had two on-site meetings. So is it because the other three um, facilities aren't impacted by the changes, or? Uh, and well, in fact, the on-site meetings were really just for the Byward market, and so I really am not aware of anywhere else where I may have impact. I don't think I do. But okay. I'm not aware right. of any of Because they, they notified every single one where there's an impact. So of your Ward 25, perhaps only two are, are impacted by these changes. I, I think there's numerous ones that are impacted by the changes. Is, would that be correct? I, I apologize. I don't know all of Todd's restaurants. So I, I with, we but you would have those contacted him impacted. about each one had they That's been right. in, impacted. Yes. So then they mustn't be impacted, it says. That, that would be my, my assumption, but I, without going through the list and knowing exactly what Todd has, I can't definitively say that there was something. Thank you. Hey, can I just uh, comment on that? That's a question. Can I just comment on that? Uh, unfortunately, you, unfortunately, you can't. Okay. Um, it's the it's Vice Chair's turn to ask some questions, so let me come up. Okay. Um, I just because I'm I'm trying to get and and you confused me a little bit. I thought it was clear, but then something you said confused me. I'm just trying to get clearly what is being asked for in terms of another deferral because this was deferred uh, through 2017 at the request of of uh, the BIAs and businesses. But if you're asking for a deferral again, um, and I'm putting you on the spot because you're up here, but you know, yeah. uh, Ms. Jennings was up and uh, others will come up. Let's just play it out. If we, if we, if we were to say, okay, to the fall, um, what would you see, like, do you see your responsibility in any way to change the design of your patios that are impacted? Uh, to meet the two meter clearance for pedestrians and persons with disabilities? If that is the only solution that is going to work, then certainly it would be, we would have to, and I would hope that the city would want to share in some of that expense. Um, I, I certainly want to work with, with everyone on that, yes. So my next question then is to staff is in your recommendations then you're contemplating sharing some of that expense, doing what we can if it's on our part to move, you know, a sign or a, a bench if possible. Uh, but, you know, ultimately it is the, the, the business owner's responsibility if we pass this either today or pass it today with uh, deferring implementation till the fall. Is that correct? Certainly, Chair. The intent has always been collaboration, which is why we uh, did hire Parsons uh, to undertake a study per patio of every single patio uh, that's that's under our right-of-way patio bylaw and present to the patio owner some options. At the end of the day, we have to rely on them to provide us with the design that, that meets their business needs within the rules. But it was a really good uh, uh, process in the fact that it also gave us the opportunity to speak to patio owners about other opportunities that they weren't aware of, street side spots, now curbside spots, uh, not having to have risers necessarily where they thought that they did. Um, so certainly we have always uh, been approaching this in the spirit of collaboration uh, through the work that Parsons did and, and Linda's team going out. And yes, uh, the intention was to carry that forward with the removal of city infrastructure on our side that we can do to clear up uh, the clearway even more. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. Um, just a, a quick follow-up question. So I, I just want to be absolutely clear what you're asking for here. It seems what you're asking for, and correct me if I'm wrong, is a deferral to the fall is fine as long as we agree with you at the end of that. If, if, we want to, if, we want to, if we want to put the bylaw in as it's currently proposed, which I'm getting suspicion you're not crazy about, um, then a deferral to the fall is not going to solve your problem. I actually didn't say I wasn't crazy about the bylaw. It's, you know, it needs to be deferred. We need to discuss it. That, that's all. And so I'd like to see the deferral till uh, the fall. No, but, you, but, but again, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you, you, you clarified that statement or, or put context around that statement a couple of times by saying if we can come to an agreement, if we can come to a consensus. So, you know, I guess what you're asking me about is the bylaw. It's not the bylaw I'm talking about. It's the solutions that I'm working out with city staff that I'm talking about. You have a bylaw that gives a framework. I'm fine with the framework. It just needs to get the implementation of that framework needs to get delayed till the fall. So you don't quarrel with the two meter clear away? I'm not quarreling with the two meter clear away now. Okay, just because we were, I think I speak for all of us, we, we weren't sure because yes. some of your comments seem to suggest you want to work towards a different bylaw, a different no, resolution. No, that, that wasn't what I was saying. I said we, I agree with the idea and the, the two readers were fine with working it out at, at the right time and how to work it out is, is again, we're getting, we're getting in that gray area so again. That, that we're not sure what you mean when you're talking about working it out. Like it's either two so meters or it's not no, two meters. So moving a sign. Is the sign going to get moved out of the way? Or do we have to shrink our patio in that area? That's those are the details. Oh, well, that's, that's easy. <laughs> I mean, it, I can answer that question for you right now. So if it's city infrastructure, if it's a sign, if it's a park bench, um, that's, that's where the other portion of the recommendations comes into effect with the money being set aside. That money is, is set aside to this season to move to move that street furniture, to move that garbage can, to move that sign. So that the onus is not going to be on you as a business owner to do that. The onus is going to be on the city to do that. Um, uh, so if that's, if that's your concern about implementation, I've just answered your question. The city will, city will take care of that. It's not going to be on you. It's not going to be your obligation. It's not going to be your cost. It's also the timing of that. If you're going to do it right in the middle of patio season, it's obviously not a time when we would like to see it. We would like to see all of the implementation of that work in the fall. Okay, that's, that's a different question, but, but thank you for the clarification. Um, I don't think there's any more questions for this delegation, so I'm, unless, yeah, sorry, Councillor Caudry. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair, and that's exactly what I was trying to clarify, is what Chair just said. If, if the committee agrees to delay this till the fall, what are some of the topics that you want to put on the table other than the ones that you already mentioned? Or are those the only uh, subject matters that you want to put on the table? Those are my only subject matters. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so again, I, I, this time I think I'm right. There are no more questions for the delegation. Uh, so uh, Mr. Manuk is, is next. And I know you know the rules. Don't necessarily follow them, but I know you know them. Good morning. Well, maybe it's good afternoon now. I've been here a while, but uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Manuk. Uh, I have a number of businesses in the Byward market. Uh, I also represent some other organizations, but today I'm just representing as vice chair of the BIA, the Byward market, and my particular businesses. Um, obviously, my presentation, I see Yazda and Mr. Brown have brought up a lot of the things, so I, I don't really want to repeat those, and I want to make sure I get some things into um, into the record, and maybe the questions will be asked, maybe they won't. Um, I've been going through this patio thing for a long time. I was, you know, when from when I was chair of Acobia to everything, we've you've seen me many times. So maybe my thought of meetings is a little blurred, but I'm usually pretty good. So how I remember the meetings happening is 
we had our meeting here last year and it was to be deferred to discuss about how we we're going to solve the problem. So like every time, and Yaz has brought it up, we, in the Byward market, May and June, I want to make sure everybody knows our busiest months. And our patios, we've been fighting for years, and that's why we loved when the new patio bylaw came out, that we could have our patios up for St. Patty's Day, and especially for Easter, which is three weeks away. So again, right now, we're getting into that season. I want everybody to realize that this is not the right time for implementations. So what we understood last year about doing these implementations was we were going to talk about it. So from what I remember is they're making a, they've got a consultant firm, which was Parsons. We did meet with them in November. We talked about it, and all they did was ask us questions about what we thought and what we went because they were coming up with some recommendations. So that's really not telling us what's going on. It's they're asking us our input. So we give our input. Then finally in February, they come back and they, we meet on the street. We've met on a couple of patios that had problems or they thought, and we talked about those. Well, are we going to put them in the park, in the parking places? Are we not going to put them? So again, we're talking about solutions here. We said, well, what, and I remember asking this question specifically. I hope you guys, like, I'm usually pretty good here. I remember this question. It was like, so what are, you know, what do we have to do and what are we going to do? Well, our report's not coming out for another three weeks. So we still didn't know what we were supposed to do. And we were told the report is coming out. So we were still talking about sidewalk patios. We were talking about parking lot par parking. So we couldn't really go ahead and construct any patios without this report coming out. So again, I think we all sort of agree with this report. We agree that we want to make our patios uh, handicap accessible. We agree with the two meters, but we weren't aware of what we were going to have to do. Like again, how do we know that our patios meet the two meter requirements when we don't know what infrastructure can be moved yet? Like we don't know. They haven't said, oh, this meet this sign can be moved. And just to go back, I'm going to go back now. We've been going over this for a long time. We started this in 2008 with a parking study. We identified, especially around where most of these patios are, there's depressed curbs that are easily fixed, and there's sidewalks that can be widened there. These are things that we started in 2008 with the parking study, with the PPS study, and now we're going into the public realm study again. Like this has been 10 years of going on where we can solve these problems by, and we've agreed with the BIA and the businesses to widen the sidewalks where I know these problem patios are. We can get more than two meters there. So there's, there's other issues. So are we in doing this? Yes. But can we do some of this construction in the fall? Like we want, we can't, be implementing this now. Um, you know, again, I think that's about uh, about it. I, okay, it's under time. Uh, so, just so I understand, you know, you're wearing two hats here. You're as vice chair, but you're also a, a very involved business owner, obviously, in, in both in the in the market area and in, and in this sphere of business. Period. Yes. So. I guess what I'm looking for is some clarification. So what I'm thinking is I would like very much, and I was just chatting with Councillor Caudry about this again in his role um, on the accessibility piece. Um, what we would like to see is the bylaw passed today, the bylaw with the two-meter clear way and everything else that goes along with that passed today. Okay. Um, I think we're open to a discussion around when you have to get the work done, and, and we can talk about the ins and outs of that um, with staff. One of the nice things about this meeting and this time of year is there's a bit more of a break than a week before the next council meeting, so there's some room. But I, I think all of us around the table feel strongly that the work that staff has done are, uh, with the accessibility community around their needs um, is solid work, and the measurements are solid and based on, on good research and, and, and consultation of what's necessary for people to get comfortably around the businesses and around the market or Preston Street or, or wherever it is. So I think what we'd like to see is the bylaw passed today, so we, we're not getting into, when, when we talk about implementing in the fall or at some later date, we're not getting into discussion with, with someone such as yourself about, well, is it really 1.8 or is it 1.6 or is it 1.4? We want that solid. Um, 
but I think staff is open to the idea of uh, construction or implementation at a somewhat later date to give you some time to get your plans t together. Um, to me, fall really means next spring um, yes. because most, most patios don't carry through um, through the winter construction construction in the fall um, but I would I would want and I look at staff and I look to you it's sort of a question to both of you I would want to do something today that a recognizes the substantive work done which is what the appropriate measurements are to create the clearways approved today and I would also like something in place whereby and again we don't have all the businesses here but we have a number of the BIAs represented and other something that recognizes that you've got to get your act together so to speak and I, I use that collectively city and this year so we're not going into the spring where we're still discussing whether or not your patio might or might not comply whether so that's that's what I'm and you're nodding your head so it sounds like keep that construct works if it's a question, like that's what we sort of thought, like when we had this meeting last February, that we would go through the summer, we talk about everything, and then by November we would have come up with some solution and say all of our applications for the new construction of the patio and the ramps and everything would have to be in by like December or January. Then it would give them time to approve them. We would have the contractors ready, and we could start building them in February and have them ready for like April 1st. Okay. Again, I'm you know what I mean? somewhat different explanation because what I heard before was you're going to build in the fall that's what I heard from your colleagues and now you're saying no we're going to build next February well, I want a solution that's finished this year well, yeah but what I'm saying is in October they're going to be removed like we can't do construction like in the middle of August we're going to take our patio down and reconstruct it don't we I just that's not feasible that's all I'm saying like you know me, I'm up You're the one who's asking for the deferral to the fall. Yeah, so, yeah, so we're asking for a deferral to the fall to, re, to reconstruct our patios. If we do it over the summer, so we'll reconstruct them in the fall, yes. But you, what, what I'm saying is they're going to come up in the fall. Most of them will come up in the fall. They'll be gone in October. Right. So, so either if you leave it in October, you've got to comply, or when you have it out again next April, you have to comply. Right? Okay. But, right? Except, so we, I agree, I agree with what you're saying. And again, I'm looking at staff. I want to know before December 31st of this year that your patio, at least on paper, is going to comply. I don't want to be getting into discussions. It's exactly what I sort of just said. Is it in October or whatever? We could, or by, you could say by September, we agree that what the design is going to look like and we have our application. And you can say the application date that has to be in is December 1st. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm looking at Court and his team there. So, Chair, certainly if it's Council's will to um, defer the implementation of this till the next patio season, uh, I would advise that a, a, a date of this December would be appropriate to have a complete patio uh, permit application in with uh, the proposal for uh, how they wish to modify their patio for next season. Okay. Um, Councillor Dean, I'm thinking okay, I'm, that. I'm good with all that. I think this sounds like a reasonable approach. But just to be clear, we would be passing today the plan. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not going to be up for discussion in the coming months. The plan is the plan, right? Yeah, that's the way I feel. Like we, the yeah. measurements yeah. are what we think are best, so we're yeah. going to stick with those measurements. We're going to stick with the plan. We'll have some flexibility on implementation. I think yes. that's fine. I would like to hear from you on this point because... Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, I'm more supportive of that uh, suggestion that's been made on the table. The question I have for staff, first of all, question back to you, Mr. Chair. How many more public delegations are left after Mr. Manak? You saved the best for last. Okay. There are no others. So the, the reason I ask that question is I don't want you know, another delegation coming up with a, you know, different points of view. Having said that, uh, to want to ask staff, what does the delay in implementation do to the AODA requirements from accessibility perspective, if anything? Mr. Chair, there would, <clears throat> excuse me, there would be no um, repercussions with respect to the city's compliance with the AODA if the deferral were granted in that regard. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
And I do support that uh, program going forward. And, and I see a lot of nodding around the table. What I'm not sure is whether staff, we need to take a break for staff to sit down and craft some language that captures this. Um, because the current recommendations don't do what we want. We, we want to pass the bylaw today. We want to defer implementation. We want to put some dates around December as to whether, when those deemed complete, if you will, for lack of a term, applications are in. So do you need, do you need a, do we need to take 15 minutes maybe to talk to legal and, and clerks to work out some language? Yes, that'd be appreciated, Chair. Uh, sure, no, that, if that works as well again, but I'm, I'm with Councillor Deans. We don't want to lose in the mix that what we're doing here today is, is, uh, yeah, yeah, so is, will 15 minutes do? Okay, so we'll take a break till, uh, what is it, uh, till 11, uh, 10 to 11? Okay, thank you. Sorry, 10 to 12. Um, thank you very much.
Okay, we're, uh, we're back in session. If everybody could take their seats, please. I'm going to uh, verbally explain um, what the revised recommendation is proposed to be. Um, I will invite staff to jump in if I get any of it wrong. And um, again, uh, we can certainly still have debate about what the, the current proposal will be, questions to staff uh, for clarification. So I'll run through what my understanding of the report uh, recommendations are going to be. And again, uh, Court, I invite you, if I get any of that wrong, to, uh, to let me know. And, uh, and clarify. So the essence of what, we're, what we've come up with here is a bit of a hybrid. So today we would, we would pass the substantive portion of the bylaw. So we would pass the bylaw in terms of the different measurements that we've talked about. So just so that it's crystal clear for all the business people out there, we're not going to be getting into discussions with you about whether two meter clear away is right or not. Okay, we're going to pass that today, I hope. I think the will is there to do that. What we will um, uh, change or modify uh, the proposal is the implementation of that recommendation. And so a couple of, a couple of provisos around that. So um, we had talked about the fall. Various business uh, owners had, had raised, uh, or BIAs had raised the issue of the fall, and then there was some discussion about whether that meant being built in the fall or being designed in the fall or what have you. So if you recall, we switched to more than, I don't know what's going on with the lights, we switched to, to um, more than one patio season. So we now have, so um, we had talked earlier about December, that doesn't really work with the new patio season. So the suggestion is, and the new proposal, is that uh, business owners would have their applications in, and that includes your plans for what you want to do, um, by October the 31st of this year, because your winter patio season starts in November. We don't want anybody going through the winter season with a non-compliant patio. I want that clear as well. So the new rules will apply to winter patios, and that gives you time, to, if you're not compliant, to, to get it fixed. Um, before that. You don't have to do it by April, but you will need to do it by the winter patio season. Um, if the, the uh, delay in implementation would not apply to any uh, new patio applications, if you're uh, an existing business asking for a new patio or a brand new business asking for a patio, you will have to comply with the two meter clear way and everything that goes with that. Um, Staff will, we will pass the portion of the recommendations as it stands with the funding to deal with city infrastructure. And uh, staff will endeavor to have all city infrastructure that we can remove, removed in 2018. So that's garbage cans or street signs. If you are in doubt, and please pass this on to your constituent businesses, if you are in doubt in any way in looking at your plans, well, what do I do because that garbage can is there, it's not been moved, pick up the phone, call staff, and staff will confirm either that, yes, it will be removed by construction season for spring of 2019, or for some reason, we can't remove it. For example, if it's a tree, we're not likely going to want to remove a tree. Um, uh, sort of thing. So, but pick up the phone, be proactive, because the date of October 31st is still going to apply to you. Um, I think I covered everything. Staff is sort of wordsmithing, but everything else in the report will stay the same. Um, the waiver with regard to, uh, to uh, 434, uh, 434 and a half Preston would stay in place. No change to that. Um, so really, the bylaw would, would change as of, well, as of council voting on it, but hopefully we would pass that today uh, with the recommendations of staff on measurements. It's really just the implementation would change until October the 31st. Um, the, um, the discount we talked about would also stay in effect, but again, you have to get your application in 
approved application in this year. So again, that's by October 31st. Um, in no way are we asking or suggesting if you think you can comply by spring, and we know there are some businesses that staff have been working with that are going to be able to comply, please go ahead and do it. We encourage you to do it. The more businesses that we can get to comply as, as soon as possible, the better. Um, so it's, we're not saying to you if you're ready to go, please still go ahead and, and do that. And, um, Staff will, again, work with you. Again, if there's any, any potential city impediments, that will sort of go to the top of the list in terms of getting those garbage cans or park benches or whatever they are out of the way uh, versus the ones, uh, the individuals who are going to wait for the later date of October the 31st. So did I get all that right, Court, mostly? Mr. Chair, apologies. We were just discussing at the end there. But one thing we, we wanted to clarify was the Proposed fee reduction um, what would be with, this, with respect to those who apply for a summer patio permit this year and who comply with the bylaw and make modifications to that effect, not for those who get an application in this year for the 2019 season. Uh, there's shaking of heads. I'm shaking my head a little bit on that too. Um, uh, Councillor Codry? Mr. Chair, thank you. And again, I think that makes uh, very much sense that in terms of if somebody uh, complies with the bylaw going in now or as soon as possible, then they should be working with the discount that we, you know, we would be approving if we pass the bylaw. Okay. Um, Steve wants to come back up. <laughs> I, I, Yeah, uh, yeah, no, and I, I hear you. And, and is staff saying something different than that? If you're gonna, if you're gonna let that conversation happen, you have to do it on the audio because that's the minutes of this meeting. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Chair, I think that's fair too because it's April in the report. So I think staff are being consistent that if you do it by April, you're going to get the reduction in fees. And if you don't, then you're not. So I think that, you know, that's I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I just, but we're, we're modifying the report somewhat. So I'm open to discussion. Uh, again, our whole thing is I just don't think that it's possible right now to get plans and get everything done in two weeks and get it in by April 1st. I think by the deadline that you're talking about, if everybody gets it in by then, I think that should apply. I agree that next year, you know, this is, I understand you, you've done this for the budget for this year and you'd have to go to the budget next year, but I'm hoping that it would apply to anybody that can get it done by this year. Sorry. So uh, that's, that's actually a very practical question. So from, from a finance budgetary perspective, what does that do to you? If some discount, if you will, is provided this year and some discount is provided into the, into the, next, uh, the next fiscal year. So Chair, we did not uh, have these funds budgeted for this year. So the recommendations that were before you today were an approximate uh, upwards of $70,000 impact on our revenues. So that's why we were asking for uh, one foreseen funds from Council to offset our, our revenue loss uh, because we presented a, uh, a budget to Council that we have to, of course, realize our revenue targets. So we had only uh, forecasted permitting this till the end of the summer season this year. Um, so what I think what I'm hearing from uh, the delegation and from um, members of council is, is a desire to uh, offer that incentive this summer season and that if there was a patio, a winter patio that operated in November and December of this year, that the discount would also apply. So it would be a calendar year discount uh, rather than just a seasonal discount, but that for 2019 there would be no uh, discount offered. Well, I, I, again, I'm not sure that that's well, what Mr. Manuk is suggesting. I think what he's suggesting is if you, I'm not saying I agree with him, but I think just so we're all having the same conversation, I think what you're suggesting is 
if you comply and build in 2018, as some might do, you get the discount. Uh, equally, if you get your application in, which would, co which would comply for 2019, you also get the discount. Is that what you're suggesting, Mr. Turner? Uh, sure, but if it's going to be a big problem, I, I would think that would be fair, yes. Okay, so we're, we're talking two different things here. So my question to you, Court, is what does that do to your budgeting and your finances? Is that something we can look at or not look at? Steve's not jumping out of his seat, so it's something, I think it's something he'd like, but something he could live with either way. Yeah, and again, I don't want to bring something else up, but then again, I don't know the budget, but the budget was supposed to be how the, the revenues for the four, the four years of council, right? For the patios? Uh, the uh, chair, the uh, patio from fees were patio permit patio permit fees were reduced by 22 percent last year, and then they're increasing based on the formula that council adopted. Uh, I believe it was two or three years ago. That rises roughly with the rate of inflation. But the question I'm asking, I think, is is pretty basic. You you currently have a plan which says if you comply. Well, we want you to comply this year. We like you to comply in the spring, as your current report reads. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to offer you a 25% discount. So I think the question that some of the counselors have around the horseshoe here is, can that discount be split? In other words, some businesses will be able to comply in, for this spring, and that's great. We want you to. I don't know how many times I can say that, but we really want you to. Um, but if you're a business that feels you can't, because you don't have your design done and you feel you didn't have enough notice, and you get your application with appropriate plans into the city by October 31st for the 2019 season, can you also get, get a discount? Yes, if that's if that's council's will, chair, we can certainly bring us forward as part of the 2019 budget uh, funding that would allow for a 2019 uh, uh, incentive to carry forward. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of a way you might be able to do it without having to do that. So, um, if if you're a non-compliant patio now, as of April, you pay your full fee. If you get your application in. In 20 uh, by October 31st for the next season, and it is compliant, then we refund you 25% back out of this budget year. So we're not touching next year's budget year. You don't have to bring any further requests for money. It's all still within this budget year. Does that work? I'm just trying to keep it simple. I'd like to confer with my finance colleagues who aren't here today, Chair, so between now and Council, uh, certainly I'll seek that clarification, but in principle I think that works. So, okay, so let's do this then, if I might make a suggestion. We, we pass it as you first suggest it. You've got to be within this year, but with the proviso that you're going to find out whether what I just suggested is a doable thing or not. If it is, we can amend when it comes to Council, and I think that would meet everybody's, we're doing our due diligence, we're asking the right questions. And maybe we're not asking the right questions. So, Councillor Flay. So, Mr. Chair, just to clarify, uh, you, you've articulated a position which I'm, oh, the framework that we're voting on, which I'm very comfortable with. I do have, we were getting caught in the semantics and it's very relevant, so let's finish that conversation. But on the report, I have things that I want to put on record. So, am I doing both right now? You know, can we can we f wrap up the conversation as to what we're voting on, and then ask? Uh, sure, I'm, uh, sure, that. sure. I'm I'm hoping. I don't know, uh, Taffy. Uh, have you had a chance to sort of put pen to paper so we can have something up on the screen with the with the changes? Yeah. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah. So why don't we put that up on the screen so everybody can see it? And so. And that that takes into account court's original proposal on the dollars. Do we have to put something in there that says we're putting off that discussion or that just by direction to them to talk to finance screen now and that's just direction I think, right? Yeah, I think okay. not just a direction but clarity by the time we get okay. the council. So right now what's on the screen is what we would be asked to vote on. This modification is what we would be asked to vote on. So it should, it, it, sorry, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> okay. So while we're waiting for that, maybe I can 
I, I want questions to staff. Sure. Yeah, and I want to present maybe what this does. So we have 81 patios that are in the right of way. Um, we're asking the 81 owners to comply. We have two brackets of financial incentives that are available for those owners this year. We have physical changes that the city can do to make them compliant with the two meter clearway check. We have an opportunity for relief, for the change, financial relief as part of their application for their patio component. So two financial incentives that are available to the 81 right of way patios or any new ones that will come in. Uh, any new ones will be compliant as they come in. We're asking that the 81 be compliant as soon as possible this year. For those who don't meet the summer period, I would say November 1st, because I know that Halloween will be, all, patios are up for Halloween, so in my mind that would be a small amendment to do November 1st, so then we don't get caught in another semantic issue. And then the other piece is, I don't want someone to have the relief for their summer patios if they didn't meet the accessibility and clearway patio. So I don't know how we do it. I really don't mind. To me, the, the full 2018 period should be available for those who comply. But I just don't want to do a back incentive for someone that didn't comply in the period. That would be a, a weird incentive to create. So uh, as per what the chair presented, I'm certainly comfortable. And then for our media and for those who are listening, I thought it was, I think it was important to present what's out there. So people, please comply. And then here are the two financial components. And by the way, this, you know, we did push that back. It should have been implemented in 2017. We recognize that on both sides, we didn't have the resources. Businesses had the focus on and uh, for, for uh, the events for 2017. But this is not a new measure that we're bringing forward today. We're just working through the implementation period. So on my end, you know, I'm very comfortable with what you're saying, but I, I hope that the November 1st can be an amendment. And I hope that no business can be, uh, can receive a relief if they didn't comply during that period. So if what you and Council Fourier are saying is if you don't get your if if you don't get your plans in and approved and built for the spring season, you don't get a reduction. No. That's not what I'm saying. No. No, that's not what I'm saying. So let's say your patio is a thousand bucks, just to round it up, and you pay that for the summer and spring period. You didn't comply with the clearway and accessibility regulations, so you're not getting 25% off that. Then you come in for your winter patio permit. There's another fee that's there. Maybe it's a hundred bucks because it's lower in the winter. You've got to comply with that. So we can give you on the relief for that hundred bucks, but we're not going to give you a, a relief for the thousand dollars which you didn't comply with the relief. I have no problem that the relief applies, but I want the relief to apply to the period by which it actually the, the change was implemented. I, th I, I think what my concern is is that you know we need to make sure that the folks. Sorry, I mean, but I've got patios in in this in my ward as well, and for the folks who, I mean, we have known this is coming, and I get that you know we. It's, it's difficult to come with a recommendation, a final recommendation, ask people to comply within a few weeks. I understand that. But there has to be some incentive for those folks who will comply today, who will go out, who will change the design of their patio, um, who will, you know, who have thought that through, who have spent that extra uh, money and time. Uh, we have to incentivize them too. So I think by if what we are saying is on, on November 1st, if you come in with a plan for 2019, we'll, we'll give you an incentive. But that's that's a whole other year, right? So why would I today, as a patio owner, bother? And, and, you know, and we do have, uh, you know, a very clear responsibility to pedestrians, to persons uh, with disabilities who, you know, have told us and, and are counting on us to make sure that this clear way is in place for them. So I, I agree that if you have a winter patio and you're going to comply sometime in 2018, 
Or you don't have a winter patio, but you know what? It's now October. I've had the summer to, you know, purchase uh, my materials and redesign. And I'm going to put up that new patio, show you that it's done to incentivize them, but to, but to allow for that to only kick in if you actually make that clear way that we're asking for on behalf of, you know, mostly pedestrians, people with disabilities. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, a, it's just another year. I just, I don't see why, I, I just don't think it's fair for those who are taking the time and the effort to do it today. So that's something no, that I can and, that, and that's, yeah. that's a fair point. I, I can see the logic of that, and I see the sense of that. That's a fair point. Um, any, other, any other questions? And that doesn't include you, Steve. Uh, <laughs> so, so, okay, Councillor. Uh, I, I, I hope it will bring clarity rather than confuse things more here. I think what we're hearing from those who have spoken here is really an incentive or a discount is meant to incent, I don't like to use that as a verb, the right behavior, the good behavior, the direction that we want to move in. So it would be perverse if someone was able to delay constructing their patio for this season saying, oh dear, I couldn't do it in time, um, but I'd love to get that discount again next year. Um, the, the discount really has to be to motivate people to try to comply for this year. If they can't, I don't want to unnecessarily use a stick and say, bad, we're going to punish you, but rather, okay, you're not going to get that reward discount for it. So there's enough complicated moving parts, the, 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 the spring, summer, the winter, that I think what we're looking for is to, to give direction to staff that are coming back at the council meeting to essentially lay out the muddled sort of direction we're trying to give them um, with numbers, with dates, uh, if that is the will of the committee in, in the way that I've just described it, you know, offer the incentive to try and comply, don't reward unnecessary delay, but also don't unnecessarily punish. If you can put that under one chart, that would be magic. <laughs> yeah, no, and, 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 and again, as I said, I think that's, I think that's a fair point. So any direction I gave you, you can just withdraw the direction. I think that, I think that makes it. And no, Steve, sorry, I've really got the rules for you. I can't. <laughs> Unless anybody has any further questions for Mr. Minow? <laughs> got to ask you to take your seat, Steve. Sorry. Oh, Councillor Cadre. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just on, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Manak and I were sharing some conversation during the break, and I just want to know why, Mr. Manak, with all the great ideas that you have, Steve, why would you wait till the last minute to bring this to the uh, table? So go ahead. Yeah, I, I do try to work with staff, and, and I know, you know, some of you just tell me that I should call and talk to you, and that is, but honestly, I've had these ideas for forever. Like, when the parking thing came up, I've talked about, you know, widening sidewalks, and it, it continues to get, and I don't want to take up more of your time, but since he asked the question, the only thing I'm going to say is, as a business person, we don't like to give up the money, and you have 125 in there, and it doesn't have to go to the businesses, don't lose that if you can move infrastructure with it like just that amount so say the businesses don't use that 50 grand if you can do what you want to do and like make it accessible for people and you need that money for infrastructure then don't give it to us at least use it and use it for infrastructure that's all i was going to say no, and 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 i and i think that's okay. clearly the intent if we okay. have a garbage can where it shouldn't be or or a street sign and it's movable then we're going to do as much as we can that's that's certainly the intent um are there any questions now you can take your seat are there are there any any questions for staff uh, I'm going to go with Councillor Kakis first because you've had a kick already, Councillor Forty, and then we'll Thanks. pick this it up is with at you. The report at in general. On the report at large and on the recommendation. So the recommendation is currently on the screen, um, and the change is the addition of paragraph four, and also in document one, um, there is uh, there is a, a change at uh, sub two. So it now should read uh, 62 uh, sub 2 despite subsection 1, subsections 5, 2, 
in clauses A, B, and E of subsection 5.4 will only come into force on October 31st, 2018 with respect to any pre-existing front curbside or street side patio or cafe seating patio for which approval was granted by the city prior to the coming uh, into force of this bylaw. So those are the only changes um, in terms of the context of the report. So, uh, Councillor Cax, you have a question for staff. I just wanted you to know what you were asking a question about. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, can you explain, give me the context about the Pub Italia exemption and why we're giving them that exemption? I know they came here last year and they have a history with that, but why are we exempting them from the uh, two-meter clearance there? And are there any others who have approached us about that? Mr. Chair, staff is putting forward that recommendation because of the fact that it was um, granted by Council in 2012 and there has been no change other than the fact that we have instituted a different bylaw under which that patio is controlled. The patio remains in its current location and this is all in, also out of recognition of the uh, unique circumstances that you alluded to, Councillor, um, revolving around that patio in particular. And to, to my knowledge, no other patios the patio owners have um, approached us specifically to request a waiver. So what, what does that mean in terms of you guys on a site visit there and what does that mean in terms of having, you know, uh, people in wheelchairs or other sort of uh, accessibility for that um, stretch of Preston? Mr. Chair, um, what I will do is uh, if we flip two further slides, we have here the, um, it's difficult, it doesn't present it very well. Unfortunately, but it's meant to show the, the pinch points along the pedestrian clearway in front of Pub Italia. And what I would do is direct committee to the number 2.93, which is sort of to the left near the building line. I don't know if my uh, it's right here. And that is that is the general width of the sidewalk there. But for the the pinch points with trees, um, there are some benches that, as the discussion has gone this morning, will be looking to move as well as the public art. So on the whole, for the most part, the pedestrian clearway there is over two meters wide. It's just in these limited instances for that very brief instant where there may be a tree or the public art that it reduces down to a level below the two meters uh, required by the bylaw. I remember last year too, there was some um, bars or pubs or other restaurant owners that came from Elgin as well. And there was a few similar spots in Elgin where some of the people requested similar things. So I'm just wondering what, why aren't we sort of accommodating or exempting them or how's that situation different uh, if at all relative to what's happening here on Preston? Uh, Councillor, so Elgin is a special case in, in that we will be uh, redesigning and rebuilding Elgin in 2019. So the, the Elgin businesses um, are, due to something we, we discussed in the past uh, earlier, are exempt from this bylaw until after the work is done on Elgin Street. When the work is done on Elgin Street, it will be designed in such a way that essentially everybody will be compliant. So that's, that's why Elgin, Elgin Street is not specifically mentioned. We've dealt with that before and it's contingent on the work that's going to, the redesign work. When that redesign work has been done, we'll, we'll have uh, constructed the, the sidewalks and, and the road in such a way that that clearway will be there. Okay. So outside of the, um, the ones that were here last year from Elgin as well as Pub Italia, there's nobody else that's requested an exemption or asked us uh, with concerns in that regard? No, Mr. Chair. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Flurry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I, I'm bringing up the conversation uh, to to the report level. I, there's three elements that uh, I discussed with staff that I just want to make f uh, for public record. Uh, first one being relating to zoning infractions. So. If, uh, if, a, uh, if a patio owner were to come in and ask for the right-of-way application uh, but was an infraction of our zoning, thinking specifically of the market, those who aren't allowed to be nightclubs and bars, uh, we could restrict uh, them getting that, that access. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, the, uh, the bylaw gives the authority of the general manager to impose conditions with respect to the permit, and one of those conditions that could be imposed is that the associated business, um, the, the business associated with the patio, sorry, um, is undertaking a use that is um, permitted under the zoning bylaw. Mm -hmm. 
Um, too, another one, so too often we, um, we have like a, I'm sorry, but I'll move the A-frame issue, which A-frames come and impede often on that two meter clear way. Um, can you clarify what was done as part of this bylaw to ensure that when we talk about a two meter clear way, the business is also responsible if they put an A-frame in that two meter clear way and have a patio, you know, they, they, they have that responsibility. How, have we, how are we able to enforce that as part of these, uh, these efforts? Mr. Chair, the, the pedestrian clearway by definition means a, a clear and unencumbered area and uh, with that comes the ability to enforce the requirement to provide it and as such we can require patio owners, whether it be through the uh, revocation of the permit for non-compliance with the bylaw or through a regulatory charge to ensure that area is kept clear and in addition to that there's also an educational component that we undertake with the patio owners so we make sure that they're aware of the responsibilities and the fact that these areas need to be maintained and kept clear so we, we certainly hope that it doesn't come to the level of enforcement and that we can deal with this through through education and proactive measures in, in uh, conjunction with the patio owners. T totally agree but if, if there were non-compliant situations for time and time again we would have the tools to enforce as part of this bylaw. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And the final one is for areas, um, for areas like Rideau Street, where we want to protect a, right or, a wider right of way than two meters. So maybe staff can highlight what, what are the next steps for those areas. In this case, it's Rideau Center, connection to Byward, uh, connection to the LRT and the transit station. So we'd love to hear on what the next steps would be there. Mr. Chair, as you may recall as part of the report last year that um, as part of this whole exercise there will be a design review team made up of city staff and experts in their various fields relevant to the uh, pedestrian clearway and those, uh, those individuals will be looking at how we can have wider clearways in areas where such would be required based on the level of pedestrian traffic. Um, the bylaw itself is set up such that the, the pedestrian clearway requirement for two meters is a minimum. It is not an absolute, so there are opportunities and the authorities in place to require, where necessary, a wider clearway in front of businesses or patios, I should say. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. I just want to speak in favor of the report. I know that staff have done a lot of work. Um, we, we in our city celebrate patios. They, they make for the, in, the time of year that we all enjoy, which is the warmer weather, the nice sun. They, uh, they play an important role in the public realm improvements. Uh, and I'm happy to see that uh, these standards apply equally to every business so that we can uh, we can get um, a conformity, a standard that's in place across the city for our main streets. Uh, we want to encourage businesses to work uh, when they have tougher options uh, on the, the variety of options that you've proposed, that it be the street side spots, that it be the boardwalk, that it be uh, the you know, changing the, app, the approach to maybe not using a platform. So uh, I, I want to, uh, to applaud the team in front of us for, for their work, and I want to thank our, our business community for continuing to invest in our main streets and, and making them very desirable for, uh, for our residents. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions for staff? Any comments on the report? Councillor Caudry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, just coming back to staff, in terms of I want to just put it on the record. I know it's in part of the report. Uh, in terms of new patios coming online, whether it be this year or next year, they would have to abide by these rules and regulations if committee was so passes today. That's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay. And that includes the two-meter right away? That includes every requirement of the bylaw, including the two-meter pedestrian clearway requirement. All right, thank you. The reason why I mentioned those, Mr. Chair, is uh, through the Accessibility Advisory Committee, that was one of the important points that was raised at committee to make sure that the exemptions don't apply to anybody new coming online, as well as that two-meter was a key factor for the Accessibility Advisory Committee as the accessibility devices are changing from day to day with new technology and so on and so forth. Having said all that, Mr. Chair, I want to thank you as well as the staff on what I consider to be a well-formatted report and well-conducted uh, surveys through the business community as well as other partners like the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, I want to make sure that this morning we don't leave the table in suggesting or thinking that staff didn't do their work consulting with the businesses. I think staff did a great job consulting with the businesses. Maybe the issue this morning is the time factor. 
the time to allow them to adapt to these changes is more of an issue rather than the fact that we as staff didn't consult with the community, so our business community. So I want to thank you for that. I do want to thank uh, the business community also in terms of working with us because it's a difficult bylaw, as uh, Mr. Manak mentioned. It's been you know in, in process for a long time, and I'm finally to see it. great to see it coming to fruition today. And thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor, uh, and your efforts uh, on this report as well. Uh, are there any other questions, comments on the report? Um, as I said, the the um, the current proposal is is on the screen, and with the addition of what I read in terms of the change to the bylaw, that that um, change to document number one, paragraph two. So, uh, on the report, Councillor Moffat, are you voting on the report? Okay. Thank you. Um, so carried? Carried, carried. Okay, so we're back on the agenda then? As amended. Yeah. Oh, sorry, as amended. Yes, correct. <laughs> carried as amended. After all that work, yes, we, we don't want to lose that. As amended. Thank you, Councillor Ford. Um, so we're back on, uh, back on the agenda then. And uh, <clears throat> are there any, uh, any motions of uh, no motion for consideration of subsequent meeting? Okay, I actually have one, uh, which I'll introduce very quickly. I won't go through all the where asses, um, but the motion is, therefore be it resolved that Transportation Committee recommends the Council direct the manager of PIED to forward a letter to the Ontario Ministry of Environment and Climate Change requesting that the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, one, takes immediate steps to expedite the, pro the response process for Part 2 orders of bump-up requests as part of the Section 61 review to improve the MCEA process times and reduce study costs, and two, supports, supports changes to better integrate and harmonize the MCEA process with process is defined under the Planning Act, and three, amends the scope of MCEA reports and studies to reduce duplication with existing public processes and decisions made under municipal or official plans and provincial legislation. Um, a lot of acronyms in there. I can explain it uh, more next uh, turn, uh, next council uh, or committee meeting rather. <laughs> it's been a long meeting. Next committee meeting um, when we vote on it. And uh, other than that, um, if there's no other business. Um, adjournment? Okay, thank you.